All right, and let's see. Return the video. All right, now let's see. I need to start sharing. Share. There it is. All right, everybody see little kid? All right, good. That's my check. So let's see, whiteboard. Here we go. Well, eventually it's going to come up. There it goes. Alrighty, so that's where we left off last time. Now, we have, uh, with electronic configurations, what we've had so far is the idea that we have energy levels in atoms. And by the way, and that's not a very straight line, and by the way, molecules have energy levels as well okay so we have these energy levels and by the way they do get closer as we go up in energy all right so I'm not just because I'm a terrible uh, artist or anything the energy levels between these actually get closer and if you look at the Bohr model we decided that you could calculate for a hydrogen atom the actual energy between these oops to final minus 1 over n squared initial okay and you can actually calculate the difference in energy between these guys now if we were looking at these one thing we have to remember keep in when we're looking at this graph here or this this uh, energy levels is what's going on here this is about energy levels alright and as I mentioned last Wednesday I said you know what these are not positions they're not positions they are how much energy an electron has okay and they're going in between now for a change in energy you have to go you have to go between energy levels okay now why does this matter I'm gonna tell you why does it matter it's because these particular energy levels and these are energies this is e of n equals 1 for instance you really can't tell for sure what the absolute energy level is now let me uh, and, and you may say to yourself well what do you mean I can't tell what the energy levels are you really can't you have to have it in reference to something somewhere it's like saying you know my weight right now is 180.2 pounds how do I know it's 182.2 180.2 because I can compare it to something else all right and so uh, you have to actually go in between energy levels you can't really say what's the energy here however I can tell you because I can measure as light comes out the energy of the light that comes out is actually the change in energy between these two energy levels so we go from energy level equals 2 to energy level equals 1 we say 1 over 4 2 squared is 4 1 over 4 minus 1 over 1 squared okay and then we you know we plug and chug and we get some sort of joules all right now here are some definitions if we go from high to low we call that in an emission that is emission and if we go from low to high that's absorption okay that's absorption now why is this important well if you see light coming from something it's an emission and if something absorbs that light energy then that's absorption okay so when we look at say my shirt this morning which is yellow I guess that would be canary yellow or something like that I have a limited crayon box all I have is eight crayons in my crayon box and so this is yellow and so what does that mean it means that the light 
that the camera is seeing and what you see after it's transmitted as information onto your screen is yellow and I guess that's around uh, 650 ish nanometers there about something like that I'm, I'm probably wrong but it's around in that that general ballpark and that's what you see that's emission there's emission of yellow coming from my shirt now how, what, what about all the other colors? The color in this room, the light in this room is white light for the most part. So why don't we see all the other com colors coming off of my shirt? Because all the other colors are being absorbed. They're being absorbed. So the reds in this room are being absorbed by my shirt. The blues in this room are being, the blue light in this room is being absorbed by my shirt. The light that's being reflected is yellow. The light that's being emitted by the, mole the dye molecules in my shirt, it produces yellow light. That's what they do. Okay. Now, what does this mean for us? This means that if I want to decide, let's say I'm giving a pairwise absorption or emission, and we have to decide what is the most energetic what is the least energetic emission. Now keep in mind these guys are getting closer and closer as we go up here. Let me redraw this a little bit. Let me just redraw these so they're a little bit better to scale. Alright, so we're gonna have these guys, we'll have these guys, and let's put these, let's make sure these guys look closer and closer. Alright, and it's not really all that exaggerated. The, the energy levels are actually getting closer as you go up in energy. Okay, and they actually reach some point where all the energy levels are on top of each other. Okay, they do. They really do. And so let's say we decide that we have a series of transitions. Let's say we have, have 1 to 2, 3 to 4, let's say uh, 4 to 2 and let's say 3 to 1. Let's say have we have these series of transitions and anytime we go in between two levels we'll call this a transition. And I want to know what's the highest energy absorption and let's say we want to know the highest energy emission and let's say we want to know the lowest energy absorption. And let's say we also want to know the lowest energy emission. That's an ABS emission. Okay, so those are the four possible things that you can ask about these transitions. We got one to two, we have three to four, four to two, and three to one. All right, and so I want to know the highest absorption, highest emission, lowest absorption and lowest emission. Now, how do we do this? Well, first off, you have to know what an absorption is. An absorption means you're going from lower energy to higher energy. It means you're going from lower end to higher end. And an emission means you're going from a higher end to a lower end. Okay? First off, you have to know that. All right. So, so it's a kind of a binary sort of thing. The second thing that you have to do to decide what has the highest absorption, highest emission, without going through the trouble of you know, this up here without going through the calculation. You can always plug and chug at the calculations, but I'm just saying if you just have a pair, how can you decide? All right, so what you do second off is you just take a, you, you sketch out this graph. You sketch this guy out over here. You know, you literally sketch this guy out. And you draw him out. You say, okay, so we got one to two. One to two would be what? and absorption. That's one to two. And we have three to four. That's also an absorption. And then we have four to two. Four to two. And I'm just, I'm, the colors really don't mean anything at this point. We have four to two. That's what? That's, a, that's an emission, right? And then we have three to one. That's also an emission. And so literally, the way to do this sort of problem here is to sketch it out. This is a visual sort of thing, sketch it out. And the third rule is, is longest, longest line 
equals greatest highest energy and the shortest and the shortest line let me get my little clicker here going here and the shortest line is the lowest energy so we look at this and we gotta decide what's the highest absorption now absorption means we're going from lower to higher and the green ones are the only ones on here that are absorptions my green transitions are the only ones that are absorptions so what's the highest absorption so whichever one's the longest line and we look on this graph and which one has the longest arrow that's going up and that would be one to two three to four is shorter literally it's by inspection we're looking at it so we would say we would say let me change colors here let's go let's go to black color here and we go one to two would be the highest absorption because it's literally the longest line going up how about the highest emission well in that case I need to look at my blue lines the ones that are going down three to one and four to two which one's longer well it's literally it's three to one because four to two is a little shorter than three to one so we say three to one now we have to look at absorb these three uh, hold on hold on hold on hold on it's early okay now that is absorption we are looking at highest submission all right I got kind of second guessed myself for a second there all right let's not second guess ourselves so sure enough emission is three to one going down that's the blue line now we have to look at the lowest absorption now that would be once again our green lines going up and we're looking for the shortest line shortest transition going up and that would be three to four three to four shortest line there it is right here that's an absorption three to four is absorption and I color coded them green and and now let's take a look at the lowest emission and that would be my blue lines going down three to one's longer than four to two and so we would look at it we would go four to two and so the highest energy absorption would be one to two the lowest energy absorption would be three to four the highest emission would be three to one and the lowest emission would be four to two now how do we do this we we really literally you to be able to do this effectively this is your important step right here sketch the levels sketch the levels out that's how you do it this is this is a qualitative way of determining you know which one's longest now if you want to know quantitative in other words how much is it really then you gotta do this guy over here alright then you've got a plug and chug keep it in mind it's the difference of the reciprocal of the squares final minus initial times r sub h and you, and you have you have your energy transitions and then you can actually say oh yeah well it's you know 3.2 times 10 to the minus 14th joules or whatever okay and there's another one uh, in there where you can actually go one over the wavelength there's an alternative one in your textbook it's one over the wavelength and once again you have blah 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 one over the n squared minus n squared okay and as I mentioned last Wednesday this particular formula uh, this Rigberg equation on the upper right is only useful for hydrogen atoms and as such it's it's not very all that typically all that useful at all but it is time honored tradition to torture chemistry students by throwing these into quizzes homeworks and tests okay just to show you that there is some way of calculating these transitions without a big computer all right okay so we have these energy levels now and we can we can actually calculate these out now we'll draw up another energy level here let's switch gears completely here almost now remember this right here and I'm gonna go ahead and sketch this out again this right here and let me do this carefully 
bear with me for a second here. n equals 1, n equals 2, n equals 3, n equals 4. Okay? These energy levels, which get closer and closer as we go up in energy, are for hydrogen atoms. All right, these neatly spaced lines, which can be very accurately described with our Rydberg equation, are for hydrogen atoms. Now, for anything other than a hydrogen atom, if you remember on Wednesday, you have multi-electrons. The electrons are interacting with each other around the atom. It's not just the electrons being attracted to the protons. The electrons are being repelled by each other. And because of that, what ends up happening is that these energy levels in non-hydrogen atoms end up splitting. This guy splits. These guys split up here. And these guys split up here as well. They end up splitting. These energy levels split into sublevels. And not only do they split up in sublevels, they actually move around a little bit. And I'm just not I'm just picking arbitrary atoms here. They they move around in well known patterns, okay? But just for the sake of argument, let's just say they split up like this. They generally stay kind of in the same general area, uh, but they do split. Now, within these these uh, levels which have split here, it's still, say, n equals 1. It's still n equals 2. It's still n equals 3. It's still n equals 4. But now we have these sub-levels, or what are called sub-shells. All right, more on that later what we call these sublevels. And so now that all of a sudden we've got to keep track of where all these these levels are, all right? And so what we're going to do is we're going to say first off, we're going to say n is called the primary. Now we have a name. We say these guys are the primary. And we're going to say that n goes from 1 to 2 to dot 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 whatever you want it to be up to whatever n okay it can be any number you want it to be as long as it's a whole number and if you look over here on the left hand side sure enough you see that n equals 1 2 3 4 whatever depending on what energy level you are on now we call it not just an energy level we call it a primary quantum number it's the primary number, otherwise known as the n number. Sometimes we just call it the n number, but it's the primary. Okay, let me fix that er here. Er, there it goes. Okay. Now, within these sublevels, these sublevels, we're going to call these l. It's lowercase l. And we're going to call this the angular momentum. Okay, we're going to call this the angular momentum number. All right, and it's lowercase l is what we're going to call it. And we're going to say that l, the allowed values for l is um, 0 dot 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 to n minus 1 and these are what are called allowed values or allowed numbers okay allowed numbers now when I say allowed numbers L and by the way, we're developing this to, to describe the position of an electron. L can either be 0 or maybe 1, maybe 2, maybe 3. Okay, And it's just one number out of a set of numbers. And it's the same thing with n. 
n can be 1, n can be 2, n can be 3, n can be 4, n can be many numbers, but it's only one number. It's like an address. What we're developing here is an address in a sense. Um, there are many addresses, but your address is just one. All right? And so when we're trying to describe the quantum numbers here, we're going to say that they're described by a set of numbers. And we're going to start with n as the level and l as the angular momentum. Okay, and angular momentum comes from the interaction of the electrons with each other within the atom. Okay, now if we stick this atom or molecule in a strong magnetic field, we get something called m sub l. Okay, and it's another quantum number and what it does is it actually splits out the L into even smaller sublevels which appear spectroscopically. And so for n equals 1 it stays the same and then it ends up splitting these guys even further apart into uh, different ones. So this splits, this is 1, this guy ends up splitting into 3. Uh, this guy ends up splitting into three right here, and this guy ends up splitting into, let me see if I can do this without messing, well, let's see, one, two, three, four, five, okay? They end up splitting into even smaller levels, okay, in a sense, okay? And so M sub L depends upon L, and we say that M sub L goes from minus L dot 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 to include zero dot 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 two plus L. Okay, these are also allowed values. Okay, so let me put something down here on the bottom. I'm going to say M sub L depends on L and L depends on N. Okay? M sub L depends on L and L depends on N. Okay, so N can be anything you want it to be as long as it's a whole number, a positive whole number starting with 1 on up. All right, as far as allowed numbers. Once you set n, l is limited by the n that you have. And once you set l depending on n, then m sub l depends on whatever l is. All right. And our final quantum number that we're going to use is something called m sub s. Once again, this is in a strong magnetic field that you see these things. And it's called the... Um, spin of the electron and this is plus a half minus a half. These are two values that are allowed. These are also the allowed. Now M sub S doesn't depend on anything else. It doesn't depend on N. It doesn't depend on L. It doesn't depend on M sub L. And it is the spin of an electron. An electron uh, actually has a spin up it's a half arrow and spin down which is a half arrow so if I was to put an electron over here that would be spin up and if I was to put a second electron over here that would be spin down so that I'd have two electrons over here on the left hand side now one of which is spin up that's plus a half one of them is spin down that is minus a half okay it's not a quantity. Let me get this straight. It's not a quantity like 180 pounds or 200 kilometers per hour. It's not a quantity in that sense. It is literally is which way is the electron pointing in a magnetic field? Is it pointing up or is it pointing down? Okay, and to give you a practical example, if you were to do a magnetic resonance imaging, MRI, or or uh, what, what's the other way? I think it's called an MRI. When you get that, they look inside your head to see if something's going on, right? They look inside my head, they found nothing. 
but maybe they look inside your head and they see, you know, there's a brain in there and it's got all this stuff going on and deep thoughts and things like that. And what the magnetic resonance imaging is doing is it's actually taking the water molecules in your head, specifically the hydrogen atoms in your water molecules, and it's in a strong magnetic field it orientates the electrons in those hydrogen atoms along with the magnetic field and then you kind of tickle it with a radio uh, a radio frequency wave and you make those those electrons bounce back and forth between up and down and the signal that this generates tells you something about how much water is present there so if you have a tumor inside your head it may have more or less water <clears throat> than healthier tissue and so it shows up as either being brighter or darker in an MRI. So an MRI depends literally on these guys flippy flopping back and forth between up and down spins. That's how, in, in a very crude description, that's how an MRI works. All right, when they peer inside your head, that's what, the, that's what they're doing. Okay, so let me erase these guys over here for a second. Now, why do we go through all this trouble? Well, it turns out that if you have electrons in these energy levels, and let's go ahead and populate some of these guys here. Let's say we had uh, some en electrons in these energy levels like this. Okay, It turns out that electrons can only have one unique set of quantum numbers. And this is called the Pauli exclusion principle. So the Pauli exclusion principle says, so we have something called the Pauli exclusion principle. And basically what it says is that no two electrons can have the same, well, I guess I should use proper English here. I should say thus have the same same set of quantum numbers. Okay, and a quantum numbers is defined by n l m sub l m sub s. All right. So no two electrons can have the same set of quantum numbers, which means they can't occupy the same uh, space in a sense. Okay, they can't be in the same level, they can't be in the same spot, whatever. All right. And so what does this mean for us? What we need, here's our essential skill. Remember how I, I like to put things in terms of what's an essential skill? You know, like being able to cancel units is an essential skill. All right, now our essential skill here is going to be to pick allowed sets. That's our essential essential um, skill here is to pick allowed sets. So, using these rules over here, using these rules here, n can be one, two, three, four, five, whatever. Once you have n, you can say what's l from 0 to n minus 1 are the allowed ones. And in m sub l, we have minus uh, l to plus l, including 0, always including 0. 0 seems to be left off a lot. And m sub s can be plus or minus a half. So let me summarize this over here. And so we're going to say n, 1, 2, dot, dot, dot. We're going to say l is from 0 to n minus 1 possible. m sub l is going to be from minus l to plus l. And then we're going to say m sub s is plus a half minus a half. All right, let's take a look. So how about we have n equals 1. We have l equals 0, 0 minus a half. And we want to know if that's allowed. Is that an allowed configuration for an electron 
in a molecule or in, or in an atom. And so what do you have to do? You ha what you have to do is look at it as L depends on N. M sub L depends on L. And M sub L can be either plus a half or minus a half, okay? So what you have to do is you have to look through and decide. And so look, all right, so let's just take a look. We have N. What's allowed for n? 1, 2, 3, 4, whatever. Okay, so we look at this and we see 1. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, we're good there. All right, so let's look at L. So the values of L is 0 to n minus 1. Well, if n is 1, then we have 0. We we'll always have 0. What's 1 minus 1? 0. So the only values that you can have for L in this case is only zero. And sure enough, that's zero, so it's okay. We look at M sub L, and that's from minus L to plus L. Well, if L is zero, then it goes from zero to zero. Zero to zero, including zero. Well, zero to zero, well, a zero part of zero to zero. And the answer is, well, yeah, that's that's one's good too. All right, and then M sub S can be, be either plus a half or minus a half, and we say, yes, this whole thing is allowed. So the whole point of this exercise here is you have a set of four numbers you're presented with, and you have to, and you have to decide, is it allowed or is it not? It's an up and down sort of thing, but you literally have to look at all of them. So let's take a look at another one. How about 2, 1, 1, and plus a half? All right. So is that allowed or not? What do you think? Type in the chat box. What do you think? Is that allowed or not? What do you think? Let's see what everybody thinks here. Is that an allowed set of quantum numbers or not based on the, the rules of where an electron can be? Justin says, why, yes, that's allowed. Very permissive. Yes, Lauren says yes. Yes, 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 and yes. Well, good. And if you said yes, you are, I think you're right. Well, let's check and be sure. Well, let's see, 2, that would be, well, yeah, 2's fine. Well, I guess it's a positive number, not 0. 0 is not allowed. And let's see, we go from 0 to n minus 1. Well, let's see, n's 2, so that would be 0, and 1 would be the ones that are allowed. And 1's one of them. 0 or 1 are the ones that are allowed, and yes. And so m sub l goes from minus l to plus l. That means to be allowed would be either minus 1, 0, or plus 1. Minus 1, 0, and plus 1 would be allowed values, and sure enough, that's that's one of them. And m sub s can be either plus or half or minus a half. So sure enough, it's allowed. All right, so let me put another one down here. Let's say 3, uh, 2, minus 1, minus a half. What do you think? Allowed or not? What do you think? And you say, and Justin says, why yes it's allowed. You know, it's kind of like, you know, I hate to say this, but, you know, my answer to everything is yes, because I'm permissive daddy. My little girl says, can I have a puppy? And I say, why, yes. Mom says no. So I guess everything here is yes, right? Everything's yes. And sure enough, this is allowed. This is allowed. So we got three, one, two, three. Yep, sure enough. What's the allowed values for N? It could be zero. It could be one. It could be two. Two is allowed. Uh, minus L to plus L, we've got, what are the allowed values for L here? 
we've got, well, if you start with 2, that's minus 2, minus 1, 0, plus 1, plus 2. Minus 1 is in that bunch. And then, of course, you got minus 1, plus 1. Okay, so let's, let's uh, how, about, how about one more? How about uh, 3, 3, 2, plus a half? 3, 3, 2 plus a half. What do you think? Allowed or not? Ms. Moore says no. Justin says no. Maria says no. And you're right. Because you see the 3, the three's okay. This one right here is not. Okay, now this one would be allowed and that one would be allowed. But you see, here's the point I'm trying to make here. First off, uh, L goes from 0 0, right? 1 and 2. And minus 1 is the maximum. So 2 would be the maximum. And so 3 is not in there. Well, what about this 2? The 2's okay, right? The 2 would be okay because that would be minus 3, minus 2, minus 1, 0, plus 1, plus 2, plus 3. And the 2 would be allowed based on the 3. But you see, all four of them have to be okay. All four of them. So if any one of them's messed up, the whole thing is messed up. All right, so that's not allowed right there. Okay, so that's not allowed. All right, now, let's, all right, everybody okay on that? That's just, an, that's just, it's a real, one of these things where you just got to be able to do it, okay? That's what this is. You got to be able to look at a set of numbers and decide whether it's allowed or not. All right, now, having said that, so let's go back to, we have N, let me just draw these out, we have N, we have L, we have M sub L, and M sub S, and what do these things mean physically? What do these things mean physically? Well, N is your primary, that's for sure. We know that, that's the primary energy level, where are you at? But L has an even more interesting um, physical reality to it. And L tells you the shape. Now, what do we mean by shape? Because so far, we've just been dealing in, in abstract sort of things. These energy levels, right? More energy, higher up, kind of like orbit kind of like the orbit around the planet it takes more energy to kick you into a higher orbit than it does to a lower orbit but what I mean by shape and now we get into something called an orbital an orbital is where you expect to find an electron. All right. So an orbital is where I expect to find an electron. And you may say to yourself, what in the world do you mean by expect? Because if you're really paying attention to the language here, expect means I'm not certain. Really, if you say, you know, I expect everyone to do their homework, right? But I'm not certain everyone's going to do it. All right, there's there I expect that. So the same thing happens here with with electrons. The shape is where we expect to find the electron and that's what an orbital is. And so I'm going to kind of jump ahead a little bit here and I'm going to say L, what are the values of uh L? L is is from um, 0 dot 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 to n minus 1, right? And it turns out that we have different values for L. And I'm just going to go ahead and put them down here. I'm going to say 0, 1, 2, and 3. And if L equals 0, we have something called an S. If L equals 1, we have something called a P a D, an F, and let's go out to 4. It's also an F as well. 
we have S P D F F in that order. Okay? And these are actually called subshells, but they actually have a shape, and these are also um, the shapes of particular orbitals. More on that in a second. And if you have an S sublevel, you also have these S orbital, and it looks like this. And oftentimes they're drawn like a little like a little uh, spear. But what an orbital does is it tells you where you expect to find the electron. And so an S orbital, if you were to look and try to find the electron, at one moment it might be right there. The next moment it might be over here. And the next moment it's here. And every now and then you might actually find it over here, outside that line and maybe the next one you find over here and the next one here and if you keep looking and every time you take a peek and look for an electron that's in that s orbital on average it's going to be somewhere in there now let me draw a blow let's blow up this s orbital here for a second so here's the funny thing about electrons and it goes into the uncertainty principle let's say that I look and I see an electron right there and then I look again and I see an electron right there and then I look a third time wow that electrons right there where are we gonna see the electron next where would you expect to find the electron and you would say most everybody if you don't already know the joke you would say Hmm, I would expect it to be right there, wouldn't you? Yeah, you'd expect that and you'd be wrong. Because the next moment, the electron may be there. And the next moment, the electron may be there. And at any random moment, the electron can be anywhere inside of here. 90, usually we draw these things as a 90%. And you may say to yourself, but wait a minute, don't you remember we had that Bohr atom. I spent all this time in high school learning this. I didn't learn much in high school, but I at least learned that electrons circle around atoms. Didn't you learn that? You may say, to yourself, oh yes. And if, I, if the electron's here, then I expect that some moment later the electrons here and then you know maybe a little bit later the electrons over here right hey they circle in neat little orbits and the and that's just not really true that's not what happens okay they don't circle in neat little orbits like that they are well, I guess one way to put it is the electrons are are there and they're everywhere all at the same time. They're, they're, they do not have a definite position around, around the atom. They actually, electrons, when they're small like this, actually behave like waves. And so they're actually behaving like a, a wave that goes on around. Now, where's the electro, where is a wave? Well, if you look at a wave, Where's the wave? The wave is everywhere. All you can say is that's a maximum, that's a maximum, that's a minimum, that's a minimum. That's all you can say about a wave. Waves don't have definite positions. They have they they have an amplitude and they have a frequency. That's what they have. And electrons are the same way. So all you can really say is is that it it's going to be somewhere in here. Okay? Now, Having said that, it is a probability. Now, let me show you what I mean by a probability. How you can have, how something can be apparently random, but still have a shape, okay? I'm gonna prove this to you. All right, bear with me for a second. Anybody ever play dice? You ever hang out in the back alley and play dice all day, you know, with your buddies, you know? Here's a dice. Isn't that what a dice looks like, sorta? right okay and if I roll this dice I get a random number what do I get I get one through six 
they have six, this is a six face die, unless you're like in the Dungeons and Dragons with your 20 sided die or whatever. This is a standard six sided dice, okay? You got one through six, okay? And if I throw two of them, if you've had stats, this should be familiar to you. And if I throw two of them, well, each die can still only be one through six, right? But the probability of what I'm going to roll, on the other hand, depends upon you know the fact that there's two of them and so what's the possible combinations we can have with these two dice we can have well let's see we can have both of them roll two right that would be one and one and the maximum that we can roll is what a 12 that would be six and six right and we have everything in between which would be there's seven in between and then we got three, four, five, and six, and we eight, nine, ten, and eleven in between. These are all the possible combinations that we, we can roll dice. And if we were to roll a bunch of them, we don't even have to roll a bunch of them because we can figure this out logically. How many possible combinations are there for each one of these? For rolling two, there are two possible combinations. Well, actually, there's the the you can roll one, and you got one and one. But let's say let's not let's not uh, mirror mirror. Let's not do mirror symmetry. Let's just say for the sake of argument, there's one possible combination. It's one and one, okay? And we have up to let's see, uh, one and one and six, two and five. Three and four, three and four and four, we have six, and up to six possible combinations over here. So for two, we have two possible combinations. I mean, one possible combination. For 12, I have one possible combination. Got six and six, that's the only way you can roll it, right? Seven, on the other hand, we can roll what? One and six, two and five, three and four, four and three, two and five, and one and, f and, and, and one and six. We have six possible combinations. And in between we have, you know, obviously we have other possible combinations in between. Okay, like for rolling threes, you can either roll a two and a one or one and a two, and that's that's it, right? You got two possible combinations for a three. And a four you can roll what? A one and a three and a two and a two, two and two and a one and a three, and so forth, okay? And so if we take this and plot this, it actually looks like this. And if we were to rotate this three-dimensionally symmetrically, we would actually have um, something that looks like this. If we were rotate it three-dimensionally, we take this two-dimensional picture, rotate it three-dimensionally, uh, we would actually have most of our probability would be in the center with low probability on the outside but non-zero and we would be bounded. This is bounded, isn't it? Would you ever see zero? No, you can't see zero because you're you're limited just like with these ends. You can't see zero for n. It's the same idea, okay? It's the same idea. Um, you have probabilities of where you can find things. So you end up with a shape just rolling two dice one through six. If you roll two of them, you get a shape. You can get a shape out of this. Okay, so so that's why you can get these shapes. These orbitals where you can expect to find these electrons are actually mathematical descriptions. They are math, math descriptions. They're formulas that you can actually calculate. They look like e to the something something or another and if you're familiar with higher higher calculus there's things called Bessel functions and things like that all right and so when we have an s if you have that then your orbitals end up looking like this and if you have a p you actually end up with three p orbitals you end up with one that looks like this you end up with one that looks like this laying on its side and then you have one that's pointing in the board out of the board Okay, so this is going up and down. This is our axis right here. Here's another axis. 
and this is actually coming in and out of the board. I guess you'd call that the z-axis. This would be like a y-axis, and that would be the x-axis. Okay, so the so they're what's called orthogonal. They're 90 degree angles to each other. Okay, and they're coming out of the board as well. And if you do the same thing, you end up with the d's. With the d's they look similar, but they look like doubled up p's, and so they look like this. There's a d. There's a d. There's another D. Here's another D. There's four of them. And the fifth one looks like a P with a donut. P with a donut. All right, that's a D. And F's look even more like that. F's look like little chrysanthemums. They're like doubled up D's. Okay. Now, look at how many orbitals there are with each one of these subshells. These are the subshells. And these are orbitals. Those are the actual orbitals. But look how many orbitals there are. Within the S, how many orbitals do you have? You have one. Within the P's, how many orbitals do you have? You have three. Within the D's, how many orbitals do you have? You have five. Now look over here. Go back over here where it says L. You know, L can be zero through whatever. But let's take a look at L equals, and remember, what's L equals zero? That's an S. So this is L equals zero. L equals zero, L equals one, L equals two. Okay? How many M sub S, M sub Ls do you have? And these are the actual orbitals. Well, if you have zero, you go from zero to zero, right? How many do you have from zero to zero? Just one. If we were to go for L equals 1, how many M sub Ls do we have? We have minus 1, 0, and plus 1. You have 3. 3 M sub Ls. You have minus 1, 0, and plus 1 for L equals 1. And so sure enough, that first uh, P orbital I drew up there, that's M sub L equals minus 1. And for the second orbital, that's M sub L equals 0. And for the third one, that's M sub L equals minus 1. And if you look at the D's where L equals 2, L equals 2 for the D's, well, that means you go from L, M sub L equals minus 2, minus 1, 0, plus 1, uh, hold on. Let's see. Let's see. We're going two. So we're going um, minus one. Wait a minute. I'm just having a brain seizure here. So let's see. Two. Yeah. M sub M sub L. So we go minus L to plus L. So minus two, minus one, zero, plus one, plus two. How many is that? That's five. And so sure enough, this would be minus two, minus one, zero, plus one plus 2. So for L equals 2, um, you have M sub L goes from minus 2, minus 1, 0, plus 1, plus 2. And so you have five orbitals for L equals for L equals 2. For L equals 1, that's your P's. For L equals 0, that's your S's. Okay, so so what does M sub L tell you? M sub L tells you which orbital. Okay, so L tells you the shape. M sub L tells you which orbital you're in. Because the number, because the different, because there's there's different orbitals within your subshell. So you have an S subshell, you have a P subshell, you have a D subshell, you have an F subshell. And within these subshells, you have orbitals. Now, within the orbitals, you have your M sub S, which is the spin, and spin up, spin down. And so here's the final point here. Since M sub S is up or down, in each orbital, I'm going to put it right here, each orbital holds two electrons maximum. Okay? So each orbital holds two electrons maximum. So an S subshell, which has only one orbital, holds at most two electrons. A P subshell, L equals one, 
Well, it has three orbitals, three p's, and each one can hold two electrons. Therefore, the p subshell, the maximum the p subshell can hold is six electrons. Now, it can hold, now, a p subshell can hold one electron, it can hold two electrons, it can hold three, it can hold four, but the maximum that the p subshell can hold is six electrons, and that's because you have three orbitals, two apiece. Same thing with your d subshell. You have five d orbitals. You can hold one, one electron. You can hold two, you can hold three, you can hold four, you have five. But the maximum that you can put into a d subshell is 10 electrons, the maximum. Now don't confuse maximum with how many it has to have. You can have none in your d subshell. You can have one, you can have two. It's just the maximum you can hold is 10. All right. Okay. So keep that in mind. We're going to we're going to do something called electronic configurations, okay? We're going to fixing to do electronic configurations. That's going to be one of our additional skills. So what do we got so far as skills go? First off, what's our first skill? Allowed or not? That's where we had that, you know, N, L, M sub L, M sub L. And we have to say yes or no. It's an up or down sort of decision. Number two is we have to know what does L mean? L is a subshell. And what order do we go into? That's S, P, D, F, F. All right. And that goes 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. By the way, an easy way to remember the order here, and, and keep in mind, it does start with zero. To me, SPD is short for speed. SPD is short for speed. And when I think of speed, I think of NASCAR. I love NASCAR. Every Saturday, Sunday, you see, see, when I have to think of things that are that are not so uh, intellectually challenging and turning left is is a really not something that I have to think too hard about and so SPD to me is speed and FF is a, is a sound that they make when they go by so I think a NASCAR I say speed FFFFFFFFFFFFFF speed FFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFF